historia. All right, welcome to this episode of Dad Bod History. Uh, this week, we're going to do the theme, Who's in Your Five Ladies' Night? And uh, so instead of five gentlemen, we have five females that we would pick in a bar fight to back us up. Uh, but before we get into that... Um, how how so many do... of those guys were gentlemen, though? Well, all the ones with mustaches. Took the words out of my mouth. Absolutely. Yep. There you go. So however many Good that point. is. Good point. Which... We know Teddy. So Teddy's yep. one. Abe had a nice beard. Attila clearly had some sort of facial hair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but before we get into that, uh, just a couple things. First of all, um, Halloween, did you guys go have your kids go trick or treating or what'd you guys do this weekend? No, we, um, all we did is just roast marshmallows in the backyard, burned a bunch of stuff. Um, my, my middle, child, my, my oldest daughter really impressed me with her, um, fascination with fire. I mean, we were burning all kinds of things. We were finding stuff that, you know, wasn't even really going to be thrown away, but she's like, daddy, we can burn this. You know, we can burn, you know, stuff that she actually plays with went into the fire and I'm all mm -hmm. for it because it cleaned out our house. So well, and fire is great. Just don't tell my wife. No, <laughs> um, how about you, Hoff? Uh, we had some friends over <clears throat> with uh, their their kids, and we just we made like mummy dogs, and then we just sat out back and had beers. And what's a mummy dog? Uh, you wrap a hot dog in like a crescent roll dough, and then you just bake it. Mm -hmm. It's I mean it looks like a mummy or whatever, oh. but they brought over a bunch of candy, and then we just Halloween thing gave the we kind of did like an Easter egg hunt. But they were little pumpkins, and they went and like search for them. But here's here's what I got, right? So I got a couple of these these yard long. Jeez, is that a real so, thing? Yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's like eighteen Twix in this yard long box. Are you gonna are you gonna finish those off before we film finish filming tonight? Is that the goal? It can be. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta outdo yourself from so, last time. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, anyways, that's like. Don't look at the nutritional facts. I was just gonna it's a, say it's a lot of calories in each of those multiply boxes. Multiply that by eighteen. Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite a bit. So, no, but I was excited about these because it's just it's endless. But there's so much candy in the house now. Mm hmm. It's, it's not good. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, we we did go trick or treating. So we had the kids dress up in their costumes. Um, my daughter dressed up as a mermaid unicorn, obviously, and my son dressed up as Scooby Doo. And so we hit a few houses um, and did a. It was interesting. There there wasn't a lot of houses that were even on, like as far as had their porch lights on and kids going. But there was um several houses in our neighborhood were, especially there's this little cul-de-sac and there's like three houses there that all had tables set up and one house had all these nice decorations. And, and so we kind of did that. And then we kind of did the similar thing. We hid all the candy in the house. And then we had the kids look for that when they got done trick-or-treating. Um, yeah, it was, it was different. But uh, my son, man, this was like, I think this was the first Halloween he really remembers. And he was like jazzed up to go. So I think if we didn't go trick or treating, he would have he would have killed one of us because he was <laughs> super intent on it. Yeah, I think our yeah, it youngest kind of funny. it was kind of funny in our neighborhood. You know, <clears throat> I was I was wondering what was gonna go on and my wife and I decided long ago, yeah, we're not really gonna do it this year. So mm -hmm. we just walked around the neighborhood at like four o'clock. So not even close to dark yet, yeah. just, just kind of going for a walk. And there were so few houses giving out candy. The ones that were, were like tackling us. Hey, you know, here's some candy. Well, we're not trick or treating. No, no, take some, take some. So we yeah. didn't have a bag. We didn't, nothing. So I had a hat on. I filled my hat up 
and I put candy in my pocket with no intentions of, of going trick or treating. And my daughter was like loving it. And I just mm -hmm. said, okay, you know, you can have a couple pieces, but yeah, it was, yeah. It, was, it was really weird. People wanted it to be Halloween so bad and it, it yeah. definitely wasn't normal for us. Yeah, it was, it was odd. I mean, it was funny, our kids were dressed up, but then they also had their masks on. So it was, it was like, and I took photos because like, this is a once in a lifetime Halloween yeah. and I want some sort of photographic evidence of how weird this year was. And yeah. my kid dressed up as a mermaid unicorn with the hospital mask on, I think sums up 2020 to me. Yeah, um, me too yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and like the people that were handing out candy, like some had tables set up and you know, the kid would come up and grab a candy and then they put more on the table. Another guy who had all the decorations on their house, they had a chute. And so the kid would put this bucket on the bottom of the chute and they'd drop it in that way so they could stay socially distanced. It was so, it was just so different. You know, it was just another example of how weird this year is. Um, but it was still nice. It was still a nice evening, you know. Yeah, I think our youngest, he's uh, he's three and he was a dinosaur, cute little dinosaur, right? And so he he kept talking about Halloween night and wanting to do trick or treating, but we ended up our, uh, our church and school, not too far from us did a, a drive through trunk or treat. And we pulled up and we had, we were on the street for like 20 minutes before we even got in the parking lot. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we wound through the parking lot, you know, and then there's the trunks and then there's stops where they'll bring candy to you. Like they had it organized really well, but my youngest was this orange dinosaur. So we get in the parking lot and he goes and sits in my wife's lap. My daughter's this vampire princess zombie thing, purple mm -hmm. and green hair and all that. She's just sitting in the back seat. But my, my oldest son, our middle, he's in this inflatable raptor suit that looks like he's riding the raptor, right? Mm hmm so we decide, well, he's going to stand on the console out through the, the sunroof while inflating this Raptor. So mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to make these tight turns where there's lots of pedestrians and I cannot see anything to my right because I have a Raptor chest right there. Um, and the claws are, are, and I'm just like trying to, he's just totally oblivious because he's out the top of the car with a Raptor head having a blast and I can't see where I'm going. Um, so it was fun. It was All this fun. tells me is that we need to have self-driving cars sooner rather than later. Cause then I get bored. Don't start with me, Jake. No, don't yeah. start with me. You know, Throwing my bombs. stance on self-driving cars. I know. I know. And I don't care. <laughs> Been through this. Well, when you have, yeah. when you have people like Eric recklessly driving with their kids hanging out of windows, it just makes me think, well, I'd rather have Eric driving around. <laughs> blind than the north koreans hacking our main <laughs> at least give us credit it would be the south koreans they have the better technology yeah but they don't have the malice the north, for korea, that. north korea finally just got the apple II. like they're not they're not ready <laughs> the apple II c yeah so all right real quick real quick um if you had to get rid of one candy which would it be snickers, snickers. reese's twix or milky way and why peanuts or fillers get rid of them snickers uh milky way is the most overrated candy bar in the world can i remove him from the zoom call here <laughs> why milky good. way because it's milky way it's, it's because milky way is it? snickers without peanut yeah it, it, it's, it's like 95 percent nougat and a little oh, bit of chocolate nougat. the Snickers has a little bit of everything. You know, if you had a normal chocolate bar, you've got the chocolate and you're committed to that. But the nougat is just like a waffly in between. It's it's the diet soda. What do you mean of, waffly and in between? It's picked aside. No peanuts. No, it's it's just like nougat it is, is just fluff. It's too it's much. Not. It's too much sweet. Milky Way is. I like one Milky Way, but I can't have more than one before I like. Like, see this? Coma. I'm prepared to throw this in the trash because it's Snickers. And look why don't you just peanut. Why don't you just save it for a road trip in like five days, and I'll take care of that. Because I don't want to be 
I don't want you to be all stopped up the whole way. So all that peanuts, just filler. Yeah. But can I tell you something? You've been, go ahead. Thicker satisfies. That's, Thicker that's satisfies, amen. Know. And for the record, before Eric tells us something, uh, Reese's is getting punted off my team real fast. Really? Yeah. Huh. I have yeah, no problem with peanut butter. Down. Just peanut. I know, yeah. Yeah, you don't like it in its pure form. <laughs> Reese. <laughs> first of all, peanut so you're butter. A purist. Yeah. <laughs> peanut butter is the least enticing part of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And it has no business in candy. There's nothing good about it. Well, the you only... can't argue that that's real peanut butter in a well, yeah, I'm not saying it's butter real cup. peanut butter, but I have to grant the premise, right? Like cheese whiz, you know, it's like the cheese, it's the, it's the cheese whiz of peanut butter. That's what it is. Oh, so you're a cheese purist as well, huh? <laughs> oh, it, don't pretend like that that's, sh- that's not sense. breaking news. That's not breaking <laughs> news to you. <laughs> I'm a cheese purist as well. So let me tell you, I had a conversation we were talking <laughs> Go ahead. last night, uh, which is a candy bar I had not had until... Well, after I met you, Jack, Jake, uh, the Zagnut. That was my camp name. Oh, my. Well, okay. Again, I had the candy bar. Um, it's like a Butterfinger without chocolate. Yes. The best part of the Butterfinger. So good. It also is in, makes an appearance in Beetlejuice. I don't even knew that. I don't know anything mm-hmm. about a Zagnut bar, but it looks like it's- an an old man's favorite candy bar. It's the most 80s candy bar in the world. Can I tell you? Okay, so just my take first the chocolate year... off a of Butterfinger. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it looks good. It just looks like an old man candy bar. Oh, it is. It totally is. But it's yeah. it's actually pretty good. But you whip a snap us. In... Oh my gosh. When I was in camp, my first year of after college, after my freshman year of college, I was working at a summer camp, Camp Luisimo. Um and we had our training there and we had the camp store and uh, coach, coach, or no, was it coach Gherkin? I don't remember who it was, but my camp um, director. Yeah, it was coach Eric. Um, yeah, coach. Yeah, that's it. Coach Oliver. 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 Or no, there was a different guy, Coach Gherkin. Um, he was the camp director and he was like, we've got all these Zagnuts. We can't sell any of them. And, and we all had to pick like camp names. So he had fake names. And so like, well, Jake, why don't you become Zagnut? I'm like, sure, I'll take Zagnut. Sold out in a week. And these were like, and here's the thing with Zagnut is like, I don't think they were making them anymore. So these were like, like donated expired Zagnuts from 1992 that we had. And somehow we were able to sell them all. And my camp name was Zagnut that whole summer, but they are actually pretty good. So Zagnut sold out. Yeah. You sold out. I know. I was a spokesman. So what you're saying is that you're a great pitch man. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean. They are great. And speaking of, is Zagnut, if you want to, feel free to sponsor us. Um, Blagnut. Blagnut. Sponsor Dad Bod History. But that's awesome. See, those, those are the kind of sponsorships we need to go after. We need know? to go after obscure candies and sodas. <laughs> Yeah, I've got Hydrox. I've got an email to Hydrox cookies. So nice. I think let's do it. (laughs) I'm I'm pumped. All right. So do you want to get started? Let's dive in. in. All right. Before we get into who our five is, I will like to say some of our viewers who um, listened to the last episode of Who's in Your Five had some honorable mentions. So I'm just going to list those off for you and see what you think. One of them was specifically to beat one of Cameron's picks. Um, Who was your boxer, Cameron? John Sullivan, right? Yeah, John L. Sullivan. So one of our viewers picked Muhammad Ali specifically to beat John L. Sullivan. So It's a game of matchups. I get it. That's that's well said. Yeah, he said, I think he said he would crush him. I'm like, so I don't know about that, but (laughs) he was adamant. Another one was Leonidas, Eric the Red. Um, be a good pick. Stalin um, was a pick. Another As great mustache. Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin, yeah. <laughs> Which, 
I think he took that name. I don't think it was his given name, but Stalin is Russian for steel. So Joseph Steele. You would have to like trade punches with Stalin, go punch for punch, you know, because it's- I think, so I, think a, I think a Stalin, Teddy Roosevelt face off would be something to watch. Yeah. That would be one. Keep an eye on that one. All right. So those are some of the honorable mentions that we got um, from, from viewers that- I'm pretty sure in. Teddy would redistribute Stalin's face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's how I feel. You feel. You feel safe? Yeah. Safe with Teddy? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, Lincoln's going to beat all of them, so I'm not worried. I, you but... know, I did, I did have a correction on one of mine. Uh, Miyamoto Musashi. I, I had said he used a double-edged sword um, when, in fact, uh, upon a comment, and then upon further research, I may have misspoken. I may have mis- read it um it wasn't a double-edged blade it was uh that he actually was he practiced an art of uh swordsmanship because there are several different schools of swordsmanship in japan that was uh specifically for using two blades at once so not a double-edged blade but double swords having two swords that he used so okay yeah had a correction and the fact that we're getting uh fact checked at this point <clears throat> pretty big deal you know, hey, yeah. candidates aren't getting fact checked, so well, there's just too maybe many we're facts getting written check. in. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm maybe Tuesday we surprise ourselves and get elected. Uh, I would be shocked, that would be surprising. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so let's get into this. Who wants to go first with their uh, ladies' night five? And what can we do the John, uh, John Lovitz? Can you get that GIF to pop up somewhere? Is that possible? I don't know. That John Lovitz? Yeah, from the wedding singer when he sings It's Ladies Night. Oh. Clearly not. Okay, never mind. Move on. Who I'm just saying first? adding all the, the uh, images in is is the most labor intensive. Yes, it's ladies night and the feeling's right. Oh, yes, it's ladies night. Oh, what a oh. Anyway. I'll see what I can do. Okay. I can go if first. Not. I went first last time. Okay. Um, I uh, had zero rhyme or reason to my list. Uh, it's not necessarily diverse in terms of era. I'm actually like in, they're all either medieval or modern. Um, my ladies that I'm bringing to the fight. So... I'm just going to, I'm not even going to go, I'm going to leave some of these for like my, my fourth and fifth. So my first uh, lady that I'm bringing to the bar fight, and again, I said this in the text, um, if I was in a bar fight and these five ladies were the ones that were deemed um, appropriate to defend my honor, I suppose, I'm guessing they might not. Not only might I might be their first target, but I feel like they just, they wouldn't bother defending me. Um, That's not a good way to start. <laughs> no, but I pick them. Even if they shrug me off, I can say these are the ones I picked. Okay. Um, so the first lady I have is Cthulhuin. Uh She's a Mongol noblewoman and wrestler from the uh, 13th century. And um, she's actually like a, like a second cousin to Kublai Khan. Her father was uh, his cousin, and um, she's written about by Marco Polo and Rashid al-Din Hamadini, Hamadani, sorry. Um, so there's some records of her as this woman who was quite fierce, and um, she apparently had the capability, um, one of the writings about her was that she could ride into enemy ranks and snatch a captive as easily as a hawk snatches a chicken. So... She was taken into battle multiple times, both against her uh, cousin Kublai um, by her father, as well as in defense of the larger Mongolian Empire. Um, but she had this tendency or this, this deal that she made because she didn't want to marry somebody who was weaker than her. So she insisted uh, any man that wanted to marry her had to defeat her in wrestling first. 
So how'd that go for you? Um, what I found is that the man she eventually married, she did not hold him to that standard. Okay. That's fair. She's just like, no, I'm not going to have you wrestle me. I want to marry you. But rather the man she married, um, had apparently failed to assassinate her father. So kind of an oddball in that, in that circumstance. Uh, but also if they lost to her, so you say, I want to marry you. It's like, okay, you're going to wrestle me. If you win, you marry me. If you lose, I get all your horses. Okay. And by the time she was like 25 or 30, she had a massive herd of horses to her name. Um, so she sounds like somebody that's probably going to be good to have in a bar fight. She's got, she can, she can get somebody to tap out, uh, not necessarily punches, but she's going to take some people down. Yeah. She's definitely got that hand to hand, which is what you want. So that's a good pick to start. And that's a good way to make your living, you know, being a, she was a hustler when it came Mm -hmm. to wrestling, you know, in order to get that many, I, I keep thinking of white men can't jump the movie of, you know, how much money they made from hustling people. It's totally comparable. Totally, totally. the same. <laughs> you know, I hear White Men Can't Jump is actually a remake of this actual story. So that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. So, yeah, I, uh, she, she kind of stuck out. She's not my favorite on my list, but she's going to get in there and she's going to take some people down. Um, but I don't see any of her writing skills being very helpful inside a bar. Okay. Probably. What do you got for number two? Let's see. Uh, all right. I'm going to go to um, Grace O'Malley. Uh, uh, and so, Jake, you may help me fill in some details here because I, 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 my, my deal, details are kind of limited. So, uh, 16th, or sorry, yeah, 16th century Irish landowner and sea captain. Uh, she had taken over her father's uh, land and sea forces after his death. So she became kind of the, the lady of her family and she became the head of her family um, <clears throat> early Even on in her life. Even though she had brothers. Yeah, yeah, she had which brothers. Is, which but is she a was, note. Yeah, you know who this reminds me of, Jake, um, is the, um, oh, the Ironborn from uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, the Iron Islands. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, forget her, her name, name, but she was kind of the, she was the capable child of her father. Asha? Was I it Asha? So. Yeah. But, you know, she's the capable one. Grace O'Malley is the capable one from her father's brood. Um, you know, she insisted that, uh, you know, that she'd be able to travel with her father by ship. He's like, you can't, your hair's too long. It'll get caught in the ropes. And she just cut her hair and said, see, not a problem, dad. Um, and so one of the main stories from her is that, um, she had a husband and he died. And so she took a lover. Yara, by the way. Yara, it was that, oh, oh, yeah. okay. And, uh, so her lover was killed by this other family. It was the, uh, oh, I don't have their name here. Um, is it the Burks? Not the Burks. Maybe it was the Burks. But so what she did is she then took revenge. She attacked oh, the their Joyce's. castle. Yeah. She attacked their castle and killed her lover's murderers at Duna Castle. And so she gets this nickname, the Dark Lady of Duna. And so she, she has this penchant for taking revenge on people. Uh, and eventually she, uh, because there's this ongoing conflict with England, she gets called and brought before because she's taken prisoner with some of her family. She's taken to Queen Elizabeth and she's brought before Queen Elizabeth. And uh, she refused to bow to her because she didn't recognize her as the Queen of Ireland. And one story has that she actually had a knife like hidden on her person in that meeting with Queen Elizabeth, just in case she wanted to off her um so again i i like you said she had it for protection yeah uh you know much like ehud i don't mind somebody bringing a weapon into a bar as long as it's hidden 
So Grace O'Malley can be the one who brings a, a knife to the fight. Um, but she really, uh, she comes across as, uh, I, I don't want to say moody, but you know, she, she acts on emotion and that could be helpful in a bar fight. Now, if she has no emotional ties to me, probably going to be useless. Um, but she seems like the kind of, kind of gal that would rough some people up pretty gladly, uh, if necessary. So, well, the, the thing I liked about her and, and, you know, assuming this bar fight, if she is your friend, yeah. um, and someone, comes after you, she's very honor bound to avenge right. that slight. And I think that's where she really comes in handy in a bar fight. Never mind that she led her family after her father died, even though she had older brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and then her penchant for vengeance. Um, there's a couple other times a, a, a thief stole from her and hidden a church and she was willing to wait him out until he starved or surrendered. Like <laughs> that's, she's a uh, Patience you know, is a virtue, right? So yeah. So she uh she had some, you know, she she was not one to be trifled with. No, not at all. So my third gal here is um Juana Galan. So Juana Galan was a uh 18th and 19th century Spanish guerrilla fighter. Uh, so when she's 20 years old, she's living in the town of uh, Valdepeñas, um, which is in Spain. And this is at the time of the Napoleonic Wars. So a bunch of Napoleon's troops are on their way to cut through her village. And she's considered one of the most well-informed women of her village because she worked in the first tavern in the village. So she's right at home in a bar, okay? But because she works in a bar, she also knows kind of the happenings of the region. So she knows that Napoleon's troops are on their way. Um, and so she's going to, she's gonna be involved in this, this, uh, this skirmish as Napoleon's troops kind of pass through her town. So um, in this battle, of uh, Valdepeñas, um, the the statue they have in the town shows her holding a baton in her hand as her weapon, but that's not actually what she, uh, some stories tell that what she actually did was she used a cast iron stew pan and she bashed in the soldier's head with this. Oh my gosh. Uh, and other women in the town <laughs> were involved in her like leadership. Um, and they poured hot water and hot oil on the road. So she kind of leads this, this little skirmish. Um, it seems somewhat inconsequential until we realize that this battle then forces the French to kind of abandon La Mancha, which is that region in Spain, uh, at, because they kind of have this conflict at Valdepeñas they end up not being able to be effective at the battle in the next village over that was the main focal point of the battle. And then they're going to lose La Mancha and it's going to mm. put this, the, the French kind of on the, uh, on their heels. So, you know, she knows her way around the bar and all she has to do is reach over the counter, grab a, a stew pot and start swinging, start swinging. So, Juana Galan is going to be my third. Okay. I like it. I, I think that's exactly who you want in a pinch. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one thing to be able to bring a dagger or a knife into a bar, but, you know, you got to be able to grab with what's there, you know? Mm -hmm. if, if I had a dollar for every stew pot I saw in a bar, I mean, <laughs> you're a rich man. Well, they, it has to be a bar and grill. If it doesn't serve food, they don't have that. So we had chilies. <laughs> <laughs> you bring a fajita platter out, sizzling, swinging that bad boy. <laughs> Anything that's cast iron, you don't want to use aluminum. Anodized aluminum is worthless in a bar fight. Yeah. Cast yeah, yeah you want the cast that. iron. No, I think that's a great pick. The more I think about it, the better. <laughs> <laughs> she might turn out to be my best pick yet. Um, all right. So I have, I have two more. 
And these ones are the ones that I think are probably the baddest of the five. And it might be because there's more details about them. But uh, my fourth is going to be Maria Bochkareva. So she's a Russian soldier who uh, fought in World War I. She only lived to 31. <clears throat> so uh, Maria Bochkareva, Bochkareva, sorry. Um, she gets married at 16 to uh, a man who's abusive. You know, surprise. Um, she leaves him. She goes to work in a brothel. And gets remarried. And with this new husband, she opens a butcher shop. So she knows how to pick apart meat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> turns out this guy is also abusive. So we're seeing a theme here. So World War I starts and she tries to join this, uh, this battalion in her town of Tomsk. It's the 25th Tomsk Reserve Battalion. And the commanders there kind of laugh and like, go join the Red Cross because you're a woman. Um, so she goes through that process, but then she eventually gets the personal permission from Tsar Nicholas II to join a combat battalion. Uh, she does so. In one of her first actions, she earns a medal uh, or a decoration for rescuing 50 wounded soldiers in combat. Wow. Uh, she ends up getting wounded and she has to, um, so she gets wounded. She gets taken back for medical treatment. When she returns to the front, she's now uh, been uh, promoted to corporal and she's put in charge of 11 men. Uh, and then she gets injured again. She's paralyzed for four months from this injury. Uh, she recovers again and goes back to the front and becomes a senior non-commissioned of officer. So it's like FYI, a, paralysis is not usually a temporary situation. Not usually, so but it's pretty impressive. Among Russian Just women, walked it off. Must yeah. be. Uh, so she ends up as a senior non-commissioned officer. So we're talking like a, a high-ranking sergeant in the U.S. Army, if it was. Uh, so then she, she's in this regiment and she's getting harassed by all these men, like sexually harassed and kind of cat calling and all this kind of stuff. Uh, until, you know, then she shows them all up in combat and they're all ashamed of themselves, but then she kind of like loses interest of this part in this particular military post. So she leaves it. Um, and this is all before 1917. So this is in the first three years of the war. So then 1917 rolls around and the Russian revolution happens at this point. Um, you know, the revolution is happening. She says, Hey, here's a good idea. You know, if we still want to be fighting this war, let's start an all female battalion. And the purpose of this battalion was not necessarily to fight in the war, but it was to shame men who had, uh, kind of abandoned their posts into getting back into the war. Mm. So the entire objective was to shame all the Russian men who had quit the war. Um, and so what she, they do is they're like, all right, we're going to put you in charge of the first Russian women's battalion of death. <laughs> and there's 2000 volunteers for this battalion of which only 300 can actually handle the training. Um, that's way more effective than the white feather treatment that happened oh, in England. Yeah. The British don't know how to do this. Yeah. So, so that's what she does. And then after the war, um, she gets, she makes her way to the U S and she meets with Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and basically she's asking for them to intervene in Russia to, to kind of like stem the red tide as it were. Uh, and then she goes to Great Britain and she meets with King George V and kind of asks him the same thing, like white Russia needs your assistance. We can't let these reds take over. Uh, and then she goes back to Russia, works with the white army, but then she's captured, interrogated, and of course executed for being an enemy of the working class. Yeah, that's an awesome pick. In, um, in their usual fashion, the New York Times does publish an obituary for her in 2018. So 
you know, always, always first to the punch, the NYT. Yeah. So yeah, she's, uh, she's up there. I kind of think she's not backing down from any fight in a bar. No, definitely not. That's a two abusive husbands, a, a number of harassers, three heads of state. Yeah, she'd be ah, pretty good. good pick. Yeah, Toby doesn't stand a chance against her. That's I'm assuming Toby is the guy picking the fight. For Why is Toby reason. in a bar? He doesn't, well, nobody would invite Toby know. to a bar. <laughs> Maybe not. Well, all right, it's an Applebee's or a Chili's, like apparently we're assuming. <laughs> It's probably a Toby. Yeah, Toby's about I, to get beat up. I really want to see a bar fight <laughs> in an Applebee's. Um, all right, my last one. Uh, Nancy Wake. Uh, she's from New Zealand, but I, I think she served uh, with a lot of Australian forces. Born in 1912, lived until 2011. Uh so she was a New Zealand born nurse and a journalist and she ends up living in Marseille, France when the Germans invade in world war II. Uh, and when they invaded, she joins this escape network to try and help people get away from the Nazis. <clears throat> and in that time, she's given the nickname, the white mouse by the Gestapo because they just cannot catch her. She eludes capture constantly. Um, her husband, she was, uh, she was, she had married this man. I can't, I don't know. I don't think he was French, but they were living in France. Uh, they're separated and working in this different parts of the network. He's captured and executed. And she's not going to find out about that until the end of the war. Um, so she basically becomes infamous among the Nazis for helping people escape uh, France through Spain. <clears throat> and so she describes this tactic, her, her tactics in, in getting away from people as um, a little powder and a little drink on the way. And I'd pass their posts and went in, and went and say, do you want to search me? God, what a flirtatious little bastard I was. So she used her wiles to get around the Nazis, which is great. Ah, uh, the wiles. The wiles. Um, so she does escape France and she joins the special operation executive, um, I believe through the British. And then in April, 1944, she parachutes into France as part of a three person team. So this is April, it's two months before the invasion. <clears throat> uh, and she basically joins up with resistance forces and she has Intel and training and all this stuff to help them in one particular uh, action. She bicycled 310 miles in 72 hours to, to radio back to Britain, the status of their operation. So she bicycled North toward the coast so she could get to a radio that she could get to the, uh, tell the British what was going on. Um, she took part in this raid <clears throat> and the, the raid was in, uh, Montluçon, I think Montluçon in France and it was a Gestapo HQ. Uh, in this raid, they killed 38 German Gestapo operatives. And so during this operation, at the end of the operation, they have all these dead Germans. And then there's this girl who they've also captured. And none of the men as part of this operation want to execute her. And so she grabs the gun. She says, I'll do it. I'll kill her. And at that point, the men relented and said, no, 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 we can't, we can't let you do this. So we will execute this, this girl. And I'm guessing she was like a teenage girl who was a spy for the Germans. But in this operation, she killed an SS sentry with her bare hands. Okay. And what she said about this, um, in an interview many years later, she said, they, they taught this judo chop stuff with the flat of the hand at SOE. And I practiced away at it, but this, the, this is the only time I used it whack and it killed him. All right. I was really surprised. <laughs> it's like literally like the touch of death from yeah. those old Kung Fu so they, movies. They, they taught this thing and she's like, doesn't know her own strength. It works. Oh. And uh, so then the war ends and that's when she learns that her husband had actually died earlier on. 
Uh, and then later on in life, she got involved in politics in Australia. And then uh, when she died in 2011, she had her ashes scattered in Mont Lausanne, where that Gestapo HQ was um, in France. So the judo chop is going to come in handy in this bar well, fight. You know, and that's the thing is, as I was listening to this, I'm like, yeah, that's a, like, she's an impressive person. But like, none of this is telling me bar fight. But now that you tell me she has a secret judo chop move <laughs> that's going to automatically win, that's, that's a game changer. Yeah. I, I don't know if Fatality. I can tell Yeah, right? seriously. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's almost, it's, it would be so ridiculous to watch until your best guy just went down from one judo chop to the neck. Yeah. And the fact that she was surprised about it, she was genuinely yeah. surprised. Like, oh, I just breathed on him and oh, yeah. he died. <laughs> well, very... I think. Like, was I she think... practicing it on like oak trees? Like. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole forest in France that was killed by her judo chops. You know, you think about like the training that different military go through and there's a point at which it just like, well, this is what I do in the situation. And then they do it and they're like, oh, it works. I don't and even the think first they're time really you do training. It. I think they said, all right, she's like, all right, how do I learn how to fight? And they're like, oh yeah, just do this judo chop to the neck. And then little did they know it was actually the best thing that you could have ever done. Like, we don't, we don't know what you're teaching you. So yeah. glad it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Nancy Wake, uh, I'll, you know, no, that's a good in a bar fight. That's a good pick. You might not even need the other four with her. No, no. Well, and in this case, I, I can mean, say whatever I want and then back up and let the fight happen. Yeah, she'll All get right. you out of there too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's a, that's a great way to end your five. That's a that's a good one. Um, how about I go second? Because Cameron, you your your crew, I think last time was the winning crew. So I'd like to go second and see. If you can finish us off. I'm good. Um, all right. So is this based on so, your five as well? No, this one's a little more random, I guess. Um, so I did take a page out of your book, though, and I'm going to start my five with uh, JL, who was in the book of judges. She herself was not a judge, um, but she was alive during the time of Deborah, who was a judge that led Israel and um, they were fighting against King of King Jabin of uh, Canaan and um, and there was a general Sisera from Canaan and his army was fighting the Israelites and Deborah basically said you're going to lose and um, the king or the general fighting for the Israelites at the time was King or was Baruch and he was afraid to go out and fight against Sisera. And so Deborah said, okay, that's fine, but God will be with you. But just so you know, you will not get the glory. The glory will go to a woman. And um, so anyway, Baruch leads the army of Israel against um, Sisera's army and puts them to flight. They're all running away. Sisera flees and he runs to this tent. And he says, runs to this tent, he says, I'm thirsty. Um, and JL is there and she's like, come on in, come on in. And he goes, please give me some water. And she opened a skim of milk, skin of milk, gave him a drink and covered him up and said, and he said, stand in the doorway of the tent. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone there? Say no. But JL, Heber's wife, picked up a tent. So this is after Sisera falls asleep now. Picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly, quietly to him while he lay fast to sleep exhausted she drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died and then just then Bar baruch came by in pursuit of sisera and jay went out and said come i will show you the man you are looking for and so he went in with her and there lay sisera tent peg through his head dead and another um source was the uh liber Antiqu antiquitatum bibliocarum and so this is a non-biblical source. And it said, JL said, strengthen in me today, Lord, my arm on account of you and your people, those who hope in you. And she drove it through his head. And his sister apparently is still alive, lay there dying. And he said, um, and he said, behold of me, JL, I die like a woman. And JL said, go boast before your father in hell and tell them that you have fallen into the hands of a woman. And that's her story. And that's like, that's it. <laughs> 
That's all she gets in the Bible. But here's why I like her in a bar fight is because if the bar fight's going a little south and <laughs> some ruffian is like on the other side, it's like, oh no, I'm, I can't handle this. And he runs to the bar, he's catching his breath. Jael's going to be there. She's like, oh, hey, it's okay. Here's some water. And then smash, <laughs> bottle over the head. He's done. That guy's out. There's, so, there's a lot of brutal deaths in the Bible. Yeah. That might be the most memorable one. Like it's, even if you're a casual Bible you know you what's know, your fantastic. Your knowledge of the Bible is basic. You know that story. You know yeah. what's fantastic about that story, along with the story of Ehud, is the specificity with which it describes how far the implement of death was driven into <laughs> the yeah. person. Yeah, that's you know, through this, through the head, into the ground, or yes, all the way into the stomach to the hilt. Yeah. So anyway, Those are I the like details that. we need. Because I think she's going to be my she's going to be my wild card. She's going to be my X factor. You're not going to you're, you're going to look at Jael and be like, oh yeah, she's sweet. She's always here helping out. And then next thing you know, she's smashing a chair over your head when you don't know it. Like that's a good that's who you, pick. That's who you want on your team. Serving that's drinks and serving dealing drinks. death. Yep. Make sure to tip your tip your waitresses <laughs> and bartenders, folks. Because if you don't, <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna end up nasty for you. Um, at least at this Applebee's. I don't know about where you guys go, but all right. So my second pick. Call Applebee's. <laughs> what? I said, give us a call, Applebee's. Blapplebee's. Sorry, Applebee's. that's what I meant to say. Blap. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 all right. Pick number two. Um, this one is Lozen, and uh, she was an Apache warrior uh, right here in Arizona, or present day Arizona. Um, and uh, her and her brother, Victorio, uh, were on the San Carlos Reservation in the 1870s in, in Arizona. And so then they start going out on raids. And uh, it, there's been a couple of quotes that have been attributed, one to her brother and one to another um, warrior. Uh, her brother is saying, as they went out on these raids, raids um, Lozen is my right hand, strong as a man, braver the most, and cunning in strategy. Lozen is a shield to her people. Um, and then sometime after these raids, her brother was captured and killed. And so then she went out looking for survivors. And then she went on a, once she found out her brother died, she kind of went on a, a vengeance-fueled rampage that streaked across New Mexico in 1881. She also fought beside uh, legendary warrior Geronimo, and legend has it that she could um, sense where the enemy was at any time. And then uh, another warrior, um, Kaiwa, Kaiwekla, Kaiwekla uh, said, I saw a magnificent woman on a beautiful horse, Lozen, sister of Victoria, Lozen, the woman warrior. She could ride, shoot, and fight like a man. And so I just think these, these two accounts of her and specifically, she outlived her brother. She fought with Geronimo. And in both these accounts, she was seen as just as capable as the male warriors, if not better. And um, I think she would be someone that would be really useful uh, in a pinch. And the ability to sense the enemy, I think that's something that you want to have on your side. You want to know, uh-oh. Lozen can tell it's about to go down and then you get ready. Um, I think that's useful. So that's and, my pick. Go ahead. We made the point before, you know, revenge is a big part of a bar fight. You know, if somebody mm -hmm. looks at your buddy wrong, you want, you want that backup. And she yeah. wanna, went on a rampage through yeah. New Mexico in order to avenge a death. So yeah. that's a person you need that's on your team. Want. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, those are my first two. Um, now I'm going to move on to my third one. This one is Deborah Sampson. And uh, she actually fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, she was a young woman, obviously, at the time of the Revolutionary War. She fought under the name initially Timothy Thayer, um, but she was caught. And then um, she snuck back in and under the name Robert Shirtliff. And she mustered under the Light Infantry Company of the 4th Massachusetts Regiment, which apparently at the time was an elite unit 
um, specifically picked because they were taller and stronger than the average man. Uh, she at the time was five foot nine, which is about the height of an average man today, um, but was considerably taller than a man in the 1780s or 1770s. Which uh, I would like to point out that all of us exceed that five nine stature. Yes, yeah, we tell so by over. several inches. The three yes. of us are clearly above average. Well, and if you if you add and divide, then I'm like six three thanks to Cameron. So. Yeah, I mean, oh, our, our average can... height is like six four. Are we yeah. redistributing Cameron's height? <laughs> yeah, so I can live in a fantasy world where I'm six foot four and can dunk a basketball. I don't see what the problem is here. Um, so anyway, she was five foot nine. Uh, she was in this elite unit in the Revolutionary War. She fought in a couple of skirmishes. Uh, the, the battle of note that she fought was, was in Terrytown. And during that battle, she was shot twice in the thigh and she received a scalp wound. Um, I don't know if it was from a, a, a musket ball or some other wound, but she received a wound to her head. Um, she, for fear of being caught um, as a woman disguised as a, a man, she wouldn't let the doctor remove the musket balls from her leg and so she had to remove one of them by herself with a pen knife and then stitch it up together um, with a sewing needle, a sewing needle on her own, which that right there makes me, this is someone not to be trifled with because I can barely pull the splinter out of my hand uh, without, <laughs> without thinking I'm going through the most painful surgery in the world. So if she can remove a musket ball from her leg and stitch it back up by herself, that's that's someone you want to have be on your good side. <laughs> and frankly, that's pretty much the end of that's the only reason I need right there is is that ability to to kind of take that pain. Um, she also may have fought in Yorktown, although there's some thought that this is an exaggerated account. Um, but she was the only woman to uh, receive a full military pension in the Revolutionary War. So even after they found out the second time that she was a woman, um, she was honorably discharged at West Point in 1783. Uh, so I, I just think it was, is really kind of a, a cool story. I don't know how she would do in a, you know, fist fight per se, but the fact that she was taller and stronger than most men of the day makes me think that she would be someone not to be messed with. Um, yeah. That's a good one. That's, that's my number. Number number three. All right, number four, Harriet Tubman, old Moses. Um, I just think I've always liked Harriet Tubman. I think her story is awesome. Um, personally, she led up to 300 slaves through the Underground Railroad. Uh, she always carried a gun on her for protection. Um, and by age seven, she, she could set in, uh, muskrat traps. So one of her jobs working on the plantation when she was still a slave was she, she had to go set traps for muskrats. Um, she was also a field hand by age seven. And um, after she was free and when she was working on the Underground Railroad and then eventually in the Civil War, she became a spy master and a scout for the Union. And she actually led a raid um, on the... Combahee River that freed 700 slaves. She personally led the gunboats that guided the slaves, beat back Confederates and destroyed a pontoon bridge that the Confederates were using. She was the first woman to lead an armed military operation in the United States. And here's, here's the big detractor for her. She was only five feet tall. So she wasn't very tall, but going back to what Eric did with one of his picks last time, she has this tank man type quality where she doesn't care who you are or how big you are. She is not afraid of you. Um, and I, I, I just think the way that she became, she's almost mythical in what she did during um, the Underground Railroad in the Civil War. And uh, while she might not have the physical chops that you would necessarily want in a bar fight, I think she'd be the one where you're like, don't, don't mess with her. Like pick a fight with anybody. Don't pick a fight with her. 
Every every team needs that crafty veteran that you know yeah. you just can't pin them down. You can't put your finger on it. Yeah, I, I can see her being an asset to the team because as you were explaining it, I thought, okay, well, well, how does this apply? And then as you kept going, and there were story on top of story on top of story. Yeah, okay, she's she's a good addition. Like she really in every one of these stories, she has no business doing what she did. Yeah being five feet tall and, and really, you know, a small person, but yet she's the one that did it. And that's the person that you want on your side. So, and interestingly enough, she doesn't look small in the photos. I mean, not like she's standing with other people, but you know, mm -hmm. you can usually tell when somebody's that short in a photo. She has a presence. By the way they handle themselves, but yeah, yeah that's, that's saying something. So, okay, so that's my fourth pick. And this, my, my fifth uh, pick we, was- We gotta slap her on the 20. She needs she, to be on the 20, yeah. She's gotta be on the $20 bill. With the, like you said, the photo with her- Yeah, with, with the, the pistol. Yeah, Absolutely. that's the best photo. The, yeah. the Just the portrait of her is, is worthless. Yeah. She's like, oh, some old lady. No, no, give her the pistol, no, this is, show yeah. her in action. Like, Good. if she wasn't real, I would think she would be like, Paul Bunyan, like that's how kind of great her story is. Like it's almost mythical. Um, all right, so my fifth pick, and, and this one I struggled with kind of picking the fifth, and it's not that I couldn't find a fifth person. It's that I just didn't know which one of these three to pick. Uh, Eric made it a little easier when he put Grace O'Malley out there. Cause I'm like, all right, I was gonna pick her, um, but we didn't want to have a bunch of overlap. So I dropped Grace O'Malley. Um, and then the one I'm bringing is one that we actually talked about in one of our first episodes. Uh, was it the Bodacious Babes episode? Is that what we called it? Um, and that's Lagerda, uh, wife of Ragnar Lodebrok. And her time that she was alive was from about late 700s to early 800s. The reason I like her as a bar fight person is because twice, she was the X Factor that won a battle for Ragnar. Uh, the first one was when Ragnar was trying to rescue her and some other women that were taken captive by King Fro of Sweden. And he freed her. And then during that following battle, it said, Lagerda, a skilled Amazon, who though a maiden had the courage of a man and fought in front of the bravest with her hair loose over her shoulders, all marveled at her matchless deeds for her flock step flying down her hair, betrayed that she was a woman. And Ragnar specifically said, he gained the victory by the might of one woman. Um, and then later there's the whole story where he tried to woo her and she set her guard bear on him um, and said, basically, if you can beat my guard bear, I'll let you marry me um, as a suitor. And then another time, this is much later in life, where she comes to his aid in another battle. And again, it was her flanking the enemy and turning the tide essentially by herself that um, won the battle for Ragnar. And, and, and I just think that like you want, obviously you want that fearlessness, which she has in abundance, but it's clear that she is the turning point in a lot of conflicts, not Ragnar, or at least in those two. And she's the, she's the kind of person that everyone else looked out for. So yeah, that's that's I, I went back, back to this one. I was looking at some others, but it, it came down to Lagerda. I think she's definitely, if she can make the Vikings kind of step back in awe, that's somebody that you want on your side. Yeah, she's a good pick. Those are my five. Yeah. Yeah, I think she's a she's a great pick. And I think her story is is pretty fascinating. I mean, all these women really are because they're living in a men's world and then dominating at men's craft, which is mm -hmm. generally just killing. So that works. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I got. How about you, Cameron? You want to lead us yeah. out? So is this, is this a basketball team? Last this is going to be the Phoenix like Mercury? The, like the 1986 Celtics. Yes. This <laughs> is the Phoenix Mercury. Or the, the, uh, the Yukon, uh, Women under oh, you know, there you go. So I, I've got 
a couple more women with, with that crazy streak in them this time than I did last time. So I'm going to start though, with that, with that being said, I'm going to start with our team captain, kind of the steadying hand. And again, in a bar fight, there's many facets to this. There's lots going on, you know, might be a whirlwind over here, might be a hurricane over there, but you need the eye of the hurricane. You need your, your quarterback who knows what's going on, knows what to do. Mm -hmm. Queen Esther of the Old Testament. So okay. 400 BC. So grew up very, very poor as a peasant, um, was actually raised by her uncle Mordecai, and she was a Jew. One of, uh, you know, just a, a very simple um, woman growing up. Um, she's under the rule of King Xerxes, the, the Persian king who's notorious for being very, very brutal. Um, the Bible talks about how he is, is holding a banquet and asks his, one of his wives at the time, who was rena renowned for her beauty, um, Bash Bashti, I think her name is, she refuses to go and, and impress everybody with her beauty. So he offs her, okay? And the king, Xerxes, says, I'm gonna send out my, my servants throughout the, the land to find the most beautiful woman we can find. So they gather up all these beautiful women that um, Xerxes is, is going to marry, but she's going to choose the number one most beautiful. Okay, So after a period of time, Xerxes take, takes Esther as his wife. Okay, um, She's a Jew, and she decides, decides that she's going to keep that to herself. She's going to keep that under her hat because that, that bodes very well later for her. Um, her uncle, Mordecai, who rises to a position of power and basically angers the wrong guy. And through a series of events, one of the um, main advisors to the king says, King, you need to kill all the Jews in the kingdom, all of the, the Jewish people in the kingdom. So Esther, who is being the queen at this time, rather than running in quickly, hey, I'll save everybody, rush to everybody's aid. She's very calculated, she's very cool, she's very calm, and creates a banquet two days in a row, convinces the king to, you know, through, again, I know I'm paraphrasing a lot of it, I'm shortening it, um, wins the king's favor, and long story short, she's so fiercely loyal to her people that she saves basically the mass annihilation of the Jewish people in the kingdom, okay? She used her beauty, she used her diplomacy to make that happen. Is she a warrior? No, but she's capable of leading a great many people and she's very convincing in an argument. Um, good person to have on your side, very loyal and very convincing as that rallying cry. Well, and, and something really cool about Esther is, you know, with her pleading to, to Xerxes, she was, it took an incredible amount of courage to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was not only risking, obviously, her status as a queen, but she was risking her life um, had Xerxes not um, sided with her or, or, I guess, had been convinced by her, you know, because look what he did to his last wife sort of thing. So um, you want that kind of courage in I mean and, and obviously it's a great story in general but that courage especially is like that's something that you want um going into the fight yeah and the uh the happy ending is that uh the Jews went on a killing spree of killing 75,000 Persians in the kingdom so happy ending all because hey. Esther knew how to handle herself way to put a bow on that story <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know sweet soft and and smart yeah. but no she's she can handle herself mm -hmm. so so that's our team captain okay. um, 
you, you need a good athlete as well. You just need an overall good athlete. You never know what's going to happen. You need to be able to run. You need to jump. You need to be able to evade and, and get away from oncoming blitzes. Okay. okay. So I chose um, Babe Didrikson Zaharias, who um, early in the 19th century was like the best female athlete. She was a three-time gold medalist in the 1932 Olympics, um, sprinter, javelin, and high jump. Um, I thought this was impressive back in 1932. Um, her, her long jump personal best was 19 feet. I mean, that's almost a hundred years ago. And, and um, that, that would hold up pretty well now um, competitively you know, on college and so forth. Um, she was an AAU All-American American in basketball. Um, probably her best sport was golf, made a lot of money and won 10 majors in golf. And um, I thought this was cool. She was considered the 10th greatest athlete of the 20th century when ESPN did that, that thing at the mm -hmm. end of, of the 20th century. 10th greatest. And I think there were 50 of them, right? Yeah. There were 50 or 100. But um, anyway, ranked 10th of the 20th century, pretty dang impressive and the highest ranked woman on that list. Yeah, with that javelin skill, watch out if she gets a pool cue in her hand because she's, <laughs> she's gonna be slinging darts. It's true. It's true, she can put that thing anywhere she wants. Yeah, that's a good pick. It's always good to have a round, uh, just a good round athlete. Right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna use my wild card as um, Grace O'Malley, and I know that Eric mentioned that before. You know, you heard the story, six, 16th century Ireland. Um, Love the story about cutting off her hair. Um, the story that I read about was that after she became the captain of the fleet, she was basically a renowned pirate all throughout the Atlantic Sea, and um, there, there was a period of time where she said, all right, I'm going to go to the Queen, of, uh, Queen Elizabeth to ask for permission to continue my piracy. So when she went to go visit, she sent a letter ahead of time, said, hey, I'm coming to visit. And by the time she had left, she talked um, Queen Elizabeth into releasing her captured son and brother. And she received permission from Queen Elizabeth to continue continue her piracy against enemies of England. So she'd go wherever she wanted, do whatever she wanted, as long as she was fighting against the enemies of England. Mm -hmm. So again, got a crazy streak, a little bit wild. You heard the stories that, that Eric told, but also had the ability of being a great horror raider and, and not being afraid of the moment to approach, you know, probably the most powerful monarch of that time to say, hey, here's here's what I need from you. Absolutely. We all wanted Grace O'Malley. Yeah, she's, when I read her resume, I was like, yeah, I, I need her on my team. Um, well, and, and Irish gals are at home in bars, so. Yeah. It's a good pick. True. True. In fact, there, there's probably more than one Grace O'Malley that you'd find in a bar. <laughs> if it was the right bar in Boston, yeah, probably two or three, maybe. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Um, th my fourth one is Joan of Arc. Now, she died at 19, so she's going to have to use a fake ID to get in in the first place. But she also <laughs> died in the 15th century when I photo mean, she, ID. She she faked her way into the military to begin with. She should be. Yeah. She should be able to manage that. Yeah, and, and considering that they didn't really have, you know, it was a couple hundred years prior to photo ID. You know, I, I'm. After talking, confident. yeah, after talking to the bouncer, he would swear his fealty to her anyway. So it's she's in. She's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I, I respect a person, you know, who's who's strong in their convictions. And and she was very outspoken about her Catholic faith. That she believed that she was sent by God to liberate her people um, from from England. Um, and I 
I understand I'm not very familiar with the Hundred Years War, but it was kind of toward the tail end of the Hundred Years War after a lot of horrible, terrible things had happened in a really terrible era as well, just a really dark time in, in history. She was born, you know, absolutely dirt poor, floor poor, um, gained the support of prominent church people through that faith, and she was very outspoken with it. Um, actually was, was very effective in battle, ended a siege just on, on the first day, um, just by her presence on the battlefield. Um, so her legend grew over time, but ironically that, uh, you know, political prominence kind of hurt her, <laughs> um, yeah. because she made friends with the right people, but she also made some enemies with the wrong people. Um, so she was put on trial. Um, and, and that was kind of the era where if you were deemed a witch, that was pretty much it for you. And she was deemed a witch and that was pretty much it for her. Um, she was first tried for being a heretic that didn't stick. So she was of all things, um, convicted of being a cross dresser because she needed to wear obviously men's clothing to, you know, participate in the war. So of all things, that's what took her down. And I read that she was burned at the stake, not once, not twice, but three times so that they could totally get rid of her ashes. They don't want to leave any remains or any relics of her so that somebody could, could preserve her remains. Hmm. She was actually burned at the stake three times at age 19. Jeez. Definitely make sure the men's clothing doesn't survive the fire. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how amazing would it be to be in this bar fight and you get nudged out of the way by Joan and she says, by the grace of the Archangel Saint Mike or of the Archangel Michael, I am here to defend your honor. I'm, I've been sent by God to defend you, Cameron, in yeah. this bar fight. Yeah, I'm going to feel pretty protected at that point. <laughs> okay, take it from there. That's awesome. Isn't it yeah. funny the things that as you're saying that Cameron, the thing that they finally got her was she was wearing men's clothing, right? Like Capone was busted yeah, for tax evasion. I was just right? thinking like, of Capone. Like the things that these great notorious characters, and we were talking about Attila the Hun, and he probably died from a nosebleed. Right. Or like, like it's just weird stuff that fells these iconic characters that, you know, very few of them go off in a blaze of glory in battle. Like it's it's always some either totally random thing or it's almost mundane yeah. um, what ends their their story but <laughs> I, lo I love it and she's got that tank man uh, <laughs> presence right she just kind of glides through the room and yeah. Yeah, yeah I like it and, and all of those things um, check me on this but I thought I read that uh, all of this happened when she was 17 started when she was 17 and she died at 19 so all of those highlights quote unquote you know she became a national hero in a two-year period um wow. and and during that time news didn't travel as fast as it does now so it takes a, a certain amount of time for people to hear this she had a two-year window where she became world famous and you know posthumously was awarded sainthood and all of these mm -hmm. things 400 years after her death is well, pretty remarkable and what's interesting about it is that I, I'm not saying she isn't a good fighter. We just don't know a lot about how she actually fought. But the fact is, things weren't going so great for France in the Hundred Years' War. Um, largely, England had most of the big victories. Um, but then after this, it kind of gave that French identity and that unified France um, that allowed them to push the English out of their... Uh, of Normandy and, and I think Aquitaine. Um, so yeah, that's, I think in the bar fight, while she might not be physically the most capable person, she's the one that's going to inspire the rest of your team to be better than they would be on their own. I, yeah, think, that's, I, think, that's... I think Eric said it best, you know, if, if, if you're evoking the name of, of God to to get your point across here, that's, that's pretty powerful in a fight. 
Yeah, but like you mean it. Like it's not like, well, I swear to God, I'm gonna beat you. Like it's like, <laughs> like it's no. This lady, she's talking with power. You don't yeah. want to. You don't want to mess with this. Um, See, I, I think Cameron, your team is is particularly uh, slanted towards. Hopefully, your opponents in this bar fight are a bunch of like you know, Liverpool fans or people from England because <laughs> Grace and Joan definitely have true. it out for the British and the English. Yes. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think Esther cares, but you know. Yeah. I think okay. it's a good five though. Um, okay. That's, that's a good way to wrap it up. Um, well, I got one more. I got one more. Oh yeah. Fifth? Four. Sorry. So yeah, speaking of that, this is this is not a uh, opponent of the English because she comes from third century Vietnam. Um, when when you go back, also hated that, the English. Yeah, in, in third century, definitely. So when you go back that far, you know there's not a, a ton of detail um, on this person, but. Apparently, she was very well spoken, and and I'm going to butcher this name, but Lady Triu. True to Trin. Yeah, we know true, who she is. True to Trin. Okay. Yeah, just say Lady okay. True. She's busty, um, yeah. isn't she? <laughs> yeah. The family show, so I'll leave that <laughs> that line out. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that that was a particular detail of hers that was like pertinent, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that that is the word on the street. I, I I read that that fact. It was a scholarly article. <laughs> it's like okay, yeah, we get it, we get it, Eric. She had. <laughs> just he, he just wants me to say it. He just yeah. wants me to say it. Well, uh, <laughs> I'll I'll send out a link at, at the end of this uh, podcast so everybody can do research independently. So this woman. <laughs> Lady True, at 20, led a force of a thousand men um, to rebel against the invading Chinese. Um, two of her quotes were pretty, pretty impressive. I only want to ride the wind and walk the waves, slay the big whale, whales of the Eastern Sea, clean up the frontiers and save the people from drowning. Why should I imitate others, bow my head, stoop over and be a slave? Why well, resign myself to menial housework? So she was known for um, carrying two swords, wearing bright yellow robes, and riding not a horse, but a war elephant. So you know you're gonna you're gonna command a certain amount of attention, riding around with two swords, bright yellow on a war elephant. Yeah. She's basically daring people to attack her at that point. Right, right. So, you know, she's probably a little bit mouthy. She'll probably, you know, <laughs> punch you in the face and then let you know that she's punching you in the face. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, you know, she's going to have to be carried out of that bar kicking and screaming, saying, no, hold me back, hold me back, I want more. Yeah. And that's... But she's going to have to check the elephant at the door. Yeah, you can't bring the elephant in, but... But I, I, it's funny because I, I really, when I was trying to pick my fifth person, that was, it was between her, Grace O'Malley, and then Legarda. And I almost picked Tr Lady True, but I'm like, no, but I'm glad that you did. Because another article I read said um, she was very, like, in addition to being, as Eric said, busty, um, she was also quite tall, I believe. Yeah. Like, like six feet or some accounts say she was over six feet tall um mm -hmm. and just really powerfully built and so like i think you've got a you've got an all-around brawler there whether or not she has any swords or not she's going to be the kind of person that that isn't going to be afraid to mix it up yeah yeah she she adds a lot of you know that that crazy look in her eye i don't obviously have a uh, image of her or anything, but I think mm -hmm. she's going to be able to handle herself. Yeah. No, that's a good, that's a good pick. Cause once Joan of Arc gets a hold of her and inspires her, like it's <laughs> no stopping them. Jack and Kobe right there. Yeah. 
And here's what, and, and Eric, you mentioned this. It's it's interesting with, you know, we said, or as you said, these women are doing, like, if it was a man, it would be impressive. But the fact that they are a woman doing these things, especially in a time where men totally dominated society, especially warfare, really speaks to how incredible they were. Like, it, to get any sort of status in war, you had to, like, do deeds you like you had to go accomplish great feats and they were doing things that i mean uh, it i mean part of the story is that the men couldn't do those things that, that, that these women are doing and i think that's what makes this kind of really cool to examine is kind of how with joan of arc or esther or grace o'malley um or lady true it's like they're doing things that would be amazing by any person in any era um they just so happen to be women yeah, but I, I, you know, I think, and I, we probably mentioned it in that second episode, uh, Bodacious Babes, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of the difference between men and women who are these great warriors and leaders is that uh, almost, almost all of the women in these circumstances are not women who are seeking glory or fame. You know, they're not the, um, they're not Achilles seeking just to be the greatest warrior of all time. Um, they're not men who are joining up and then kind of seeking glory. They're, it's almost out of desperation uh, and almost against their, what they would actually choose for themselves. Um, they're put in a situation that is, requires them to, to take on this other role. And it's not something that they're, they're seeking personal glory from. Uh, it's almost always some sort of desperation or injustice. Yeah. Yeah, that's really well said, Eric. Um, what's the famous verse from the book of Eth Esther? Is, um, who knows whether or not you have been put into this position for such a time as now. Esther didn't see herself as a savior of, of the Jewish people, um, but that's kind of how it ended up. Mm -hmm. And she unwillingly kind of took on that role because she had to. So yeah, well said. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think that's a, a good way to end this and, and wrap it up. I don't know if you have anything else you want to say, Eric or Cameron. No, no, I, I, this was, this was good. I think bar fights are fun. Uh, historical bar fights even better. So Theoretical bar fights are the best because <laughs> they're the only ones I've been in. So yeah, I don't get punched in the face, so I, I love it. I'm a big fan of bar fights. As <laughs> bar fights go, these are the best kind of bar. Fights. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The ones where I have five historical heroes fight them for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like the idea of bar fights, but I don't actually want to get hurt. So yeah. Um, all right, <laughs> sounds good. Well. Uh, Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, follow. Um, and we'll see you all next time. I'm Jake. I'm Eric. I'm Cameron. Have a good night. <laughs>